When we look at Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we see in their midst two responses. Uh, sometimes they're responses of great faith. Remember, we looked at Abraham back in chapter 12. God spoke to him and said, leave your land, which was somewhere in what it would be called Iraq today, and go to a land that I will show you, which is Israel today. And he made that journey, which was about a thousand miles. Of, it would be an arduous journey in the ancient times. And he walked by faith. And so we see a tremendous step of Abraham. We saw it when he sent his servant a few weeks ago uh, back to that land to find a bride for his promised son, Isaac. And God rewarded that step of faith. But we also saw in the life, and we'll see in the life of Petros, great struggle to accept God's direction. We saw this when Abraham and Sarah fled to Egypt in the midst of a, of a famine. We saw it when they tried to forge a family through a maidservant called Hagar, bringing forth an illegitimate son, which would cause many problems for Israel. And today, we're going to see it in the life of Isaac, when he struggled to see clearly that God was choosing Jacob, not Esau. Abounding in Faith is the broadcast ministry of Emmanuel Bible Church of Howell, New Jersey. If you are blessed by this message, please subscribe to our podcast or YouTube channel. You can also download our app by searching for IBCNJ in the Google Play Store or the Apple Store. For more information, please visit us at www.ibcnj. Org. Our speaker today is Senior Pastor Joe Suazo. I see we have a few visitors. I'm Pastor Joe, Senior Pastor of this church, and uh, I've been out for a few weeks. I want to extend a uh, thank you to those of you who have been praying for me. I was struck with a uh, pretty bad flu, and uh, there was a time there that I just was wondering if I was going to pull out of it, but uh, God is good teaches us through these times as we've been singing about and I just want to thank you I am feeling better and uh, God as we just sang is good so you know as believers all of us face two basic challenges in life uh, the first challenge lies beyond our control and the second challenge is very much in our control the first has to do with difficult circumstances that all of us face in life that only God can change. These are the circumstances that are beyond our control, beyond our power to straighten out. Perhaps it might be a health problem, a marriage difficulty, unemployment, or 101 other things that we can face in this life. Now, these are things that are beyond us. We just can stare at them. Uh, the temptation, of course, is to worry, fret, be anxious, but all those things do not change that particular trial or circumstance that we may be facing. Now, there's no doubt that some of us here, including myself, are facing something like that. But that's where the second challenge comes in, which is very much in our control, and that is this, our response to the difficulty we're facing. Our response to that difficulty we're facing. Here, our willingness or unwillingness to accept God's direction and his word will determine the attitudes within our heart. Our heart is God's place where he wants to be enthroned. He wants to be Lord of our heart. Many times the psalmist and various places in the scripture talks about worshiping and looking to God with all of our heart. Our response to trial and difficulty is actually what I call the barometer or the gauge that determines our spiritual condition or even our maturity. If we're more characterized by anxiety and fear rather than faith and hope, this reveals that we're struggling to accept 
God's direction for our lives. If our lives are filled more with bitterness and anger than peace and self-control, that reveals that our struggle has failed to put God at the center of our lives. The patriarchs of the Old Testament, we're in the book of Genesis, and we'll be there for a few more weeks, taking our time. We're in chapter 25. We come across what are called the patriarchs of the Old Testament. That's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Key, key characters in God's word. These are the fathers of the Jewish nation by which we receive the word of God, by which we receive the Messiah Jesus, by which we are saved. These are men that we see paraded before us in the scripture that show us, become excellent examples of both failure and success and faith learned along the way. And the key there is learn. Do you know that the word disciple, when Jesus says, if you are my disciple, is actually, if you were to translate it into the original language, means to be a learner? So when Jesus says, if you are my disciples, you'll listen to my word and know the truth, and the truth will set you free. He's saying, if you're learners of me, if you're learners of God, and so each of us here, our students, whether you like it or not. God's classroom is life in its gnarly, difficult circumstances. And I have yet to meet anyone who gets a pass on difficulty. It's the common human condition. How we respond to it is where there, the difference lies. A few weeks ago, we looked at a Texas scripture in Romans 4, 20 that characterized Abraham's faith. Listen to this. Romans 4, which, by the way, Abraham becomes a quintessential uh, person in Scripture by which we can understand what faith is. Listen to what Romans tells us. He grew, Abraham grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Now, when we were in the life of Abraham a few weeks ago, we saw that there were tremendous challenges every step along the way of Abraham's life. He failed and he succeeded. We fail and we succeed at times. But the story or the account of Abraham to us is this, that he grew in faith. In other words, it wasn't something that was learned all at once. And so that difficulty you might be passing through, that challenge that you may be passing through, is God's way of growing you. You say to me, Pastor Joe, I don't like that. <laughs> Can't God do that without difficulty? Can't God do that without a struggle or without suffering? Well, I suppose you could say he could. Because God can do anything, right? But no, God in his sovereignty, in his, his all-wise disposition, chose to grow us that way. And the challenge to us is, how am I going to respond to God's classroom? You know, I was a terrible student. I went to this Catholic school. And many times I'd have the the nuns like tearing out my ears and my neck and, you know, beating me and all kinds of things. I was incorrigible. I was not a good student and I was not a good learner. I wanted to be probably feeding the chickens on some farm or something. Don't put me in a chair. I had some kind of ADD thing going on. And uh, I remember this one nun, she had a, uh, a stick and there was a rope attached to the stick and at the end of the rope was like a one inch solid, I don't know if it was oak or what it was. And if I was misbehaving, 
whack, and there would be this like lump on the head. Now, if I went home to complain, guess what? I'd get a lump on this side. <laughs> of course, they don't do this anymore in schools.、Um, I'm not sure if it helped or not. But I was not a good learner. But as the years have gone on, one thing the Lord has taught me in Christ is that if we're going to be learners, disciples, we're going to have to listen to what He's teaching us in the midst, in the midst of the trial. I often say God loves messes, right? When we look at Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we see in their midst. Two responses.、Uh, sometimes there are responses of great faith. Remember, we looked at Abraham back in chapter 12. God spoke to him and said, "Leave your land, which was somewhere in what it would be called Iraq today, and go to a land that I will show you, which is Israel today." And he made that journey, which was about a thousand miles. Of, it would be an arduous journey in the. Ancient times, and he walked by faith, and so we see a tremendous step of Abraham. We saw it when he sent his servant a few weeks ago、uh, back to that land to find a bride for his promised son Isaac, and God rewarded that step of faith. But we also saw in the life, and we'll see in the life of Petros, great struggle to accept God's direction. We saw this when Abraham and Sarah fled to Egypt in the midst of a of a famine. We saw it when they tried to forge a family through a maidservant called Hagar, bringing forth a illegitimate son, which would cause many problems for Israel. And today, we're going to see it in the life of Isaac, when he struggled to see clearly that God was choosing Jacob, not Esau. As the promised child to bring forth the promises of God, so let's stand for a reading of God's word. We're in chapter twenty-five in Genesis, chapter twenty-five, and we're going to pick it up in verse nineteen. We had just come off of Abraham's death. Now it's just Isaac, his son. In verse 19, chapter 25 tells us these are the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham fathered Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel, the Armenian of Padam Aram, the sister of Laban, the Armenian to be his wife. And Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord granted his prayer, and Rebekah. His wife conceived. The children struggled together within her, and she said, "If it is thus, why is this happening to me?" So she went to inquire of the Lord, and this is what the Lord said to her: "Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you shall be divided. One shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve." The younger, when her days to give birth were completed, behold, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, all his body like a hairy cloak. Say、so、they called his name Esau. Afterwards, his brother came out with his hand holding Esau's heel, so his name was called Jacob. Isaac was sixty years old when she bore them. When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man dwelling in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Father, we pray as we just look at some of the nuances of this text. You would teach us as you always do through the living Word of God. We pray in Jesus' name, Amen. So again, just two truths I want us to see this morning. The first is this: How do we respond to circumstances beyond our control? 
That's the first question I want us to ask ourselves. When God allows something in our lives that seem unsurmountable, how should we respond? How do we respond? We see this in Isaac and Rebekah when they respond to her inability to have a child in prayer. The second truth I want us to see this morning is, is what is the attitude we can carry along the way when disappointment comes? God's answer, he answers Isaac and Rebekah's heart, their heart's desire for family, but does so by allowing a tremendous difficulty in their lives. Rebekah has a difficult pregnancy that results in two sons. These two sons bring a great temptation into the family of jealousy and division where we see in Genesis 25 that Rebekah loved Jacob more than Esau and Esau more than Jacob. And next week, hopefully we'll get into all the uh, areas of family dysfunction that can come about, which most of us have been uh, victims of in some way or another. So let's look at these truths, our response to life challenges. The first thing I want us to understand is we need to learn to pray and wait for God's timing. Well, you say, I don't want to wait for God's timing. Well, here we see the big clash between you and God. God says, I want you to be a patient person. I want you to trust me and wait along the way. But you say, I say, I want it now, Lord. I want you to remove whatever I'm facing or that challenge or that dip. Now, I want instantaneous healing or I want my finances straightened out. I want my marriage healed. I want my wayward child to return or the 101 other prayers. But then God inserts time. And we see time as an enemy, but God sees time as a friend. The text tells us that after Rebekah becomes Isaac's wife, it would take 20 years before they had their first child or twins. In Genesis 25, 19, we read Isaac was 40 when he married and 60 years old in verse 26. Any family that has struggled with infertility and I've prayed and have striven with several families in this area, uh, knows that heartache. Or those ladies who are unable to have a child know that heartache. What compounds the problem for Rebecca and Isaac is God's promise that through them a great nation would come. Remember that this is the whole premise of the nation of Israel, that God calls forth Abraham, by which God gives him this amazing promise that through him and his family, all the nations would be blessed. And we've talked about this every single week because it's so key to understand the Old Testament and, of course, the book of Genesis, that the entire Old Testament hinges on that promise that through the nation of Israel, the word would co- a God would come. And remember, out of the 66 books of the scripture, 66 of them were written. <laughs> were written by the Jewish people. That was startling. <laughs> so any family that struggled knows the heartache. What compounds the problem for Rebecca and Isaac in this promise is that God gives them twins. Who would it be? Jacob or Esau? Remember with Abraham's life, it would take 25 years before they would have Isaac. So no doubt Isaac was familiar with the many twists and turns Abraham and Sarah would take along the way, including his illegitimate stepbrother, Ishmael was alienated with the family. Some of us have some family like that. with an alienated stepbrother or uh, stepson. 
And, but if you remember during those 25 years, God would remind Abraham again and again that ultimately this promise he had given him that all the nations would be blessed and his family would come would be fulfilled. In fact, he reminds him on seven different occasions between Genesis chapter 12 and chapter 20. I love Genesis 25, 21, where we see something good in Isaac, his faith in God. Isaac prayed. I love that. Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren and the Lord granted his prayer and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. So far, so good. Here we see God answers prayer. Does he answer prayer? Amen. I've seen many prayers answer. And there's still prayers I'm waiting on to be answered. But the text continues. Look at verses 22 through 26. It was a difficult pregnancy. The text tells us the twins within her struggled. And the Hebrew word for struggle is to bring something to the breaking point. This was not an easy pregnancy. Later on in verses 25, 26, we see these twins born in an unusual way. Esau, the firstborn, would come out normally. But Jacob, the second son, would come out as a breech birth holding the heel of his brother. Now, in today's world, this would be a cesarean, right, doctor? <laughs> There's no way that any uh, doctor who's delivering twins like this would try to do it naturally. But this was the ancient world before cesarean births. And so you can imagine the tremendous amount of stress and difficulty that Rebecca and Isaac went through. So Rebecca's struggling, and it leads her to pray. Look at verse 22. She says, why is this happening to me, Lord? Have you ever prayed that? I, I don't know. I must have prayed with hundreds of people who prayed that. I have prayed that. Why, Lord, are you allowing this physical infirmity in my life? Why, Lord, are you allowing this circumstance that's beyond me? I, I don't like it. And she prays. Why? And the Lord answers, and the answer is not an easy one. Look at verse 23. There are two nations within her womb. They're going to be divided. The older will serve the younger. This is not an easy answer for several reasons. First, it would go against everything in that culture in terms of how family inheritances would be executed. The firstborn was always given the rights to the inheritance first. This is key to understanding the struggle between Isaac and Esau or Jacob and Esau, which we'll see. In fact, in the ancient world, the firstborn would typically receive twice as much as the older son, uh, younger son, and all of the land. Here God is saying, no, the older will serve the younger. This is backwards and will, as we'll see, becomes a point of contention within the family. The second reason this would be difficult is this. Which son would God's vision of becoming a great nation come? This promise to bless all nations. Who is it? We'll see Isaac struggle with this greatly for verse 28 tells us that Isaac loved Esau more than Jacob because he was a great hunter and ate of his game. So we see within the family rivalry, jealousy. Has anybody ever experienced that in the family? Well, Rebecca loved Jacob more than Esau. So here we see marital conflict. Conflict between two sons. Here I believe this is an application for us this morning. God answers prayer, and I want you to listen to me on this, but the answer may not make life easier for you. You say, whoa. I mean, you're ready to put your ears, hands over your ears. Don't say that to me, Pastor Joe. I want easy. I want comfort. I want pleasure. Please remove all those things that are challenging to me. No, it's not the way God does it. Let's go back to what I was teaching before. 
God chooses in his sovereignty to allow us to experience things that we may be learners and grow in faith. That's God's priority for us. Our priority is comfort. Our priority is easy. And so we see these two things in a collision course. Who do you think is going to win in the end? You or God? So here's, here's my counsel to you. You need to surrender on this point. You know, peace and joy will not come into your life unless you're able to surrender on this point. You've prayed. The answer's come. And life has got, in some weird way, more complicated and difficult. You may have prayed for a new job, and I've talked to people like this. They're all happy, high five, yeah, new job, better money, more opportunity, excited about it. But then, after a few months, they come to me like, ha, ah, all these added responsibilities have pushed me to the brink. Answered prayer, being stretched. Or ever talk to a single person who's, just wants to be married so badly, it, it, and they just want a wife or a husband, a family, and then they get married, and then within the year, they're coming to me, ah, we're all in conflict here. This is so much more difficult than I thought. I thought you prayed for a husband or wife, and now you're coming and complaining to God that he provides you a husband or wife? What is it? Do you want a husband or wife, or you don't? Difficulty and challenge does not mean God didn't answer, but his answer reveals a weakness in our heart. He, it reveals a weakness in our affections. Will I follow God in the place of God's answer? Or will I, will I allow that mess that he's allowed to embitter my soul? This is where we all, and I've shared this, you know, a broken down car, we may not even have a clue what we're doing with a broken down car, but the first thing most people do is pop the hood and look inside, as though somehow the answer is going to be mysteriously. Now, this is probably something that started years ago in, in this culture, but now as uh, cars got more computerized, it's even more mysterious, right? But we do it anyway. We're hoping that that, that gauge that went off or that red light's going to somehow reveal to us something so when we call the mechanic or the tow, uh, the, the person to tow the car is going to somehow find out what's going on. Well, this is God's way of helping us uh, lift up the hood of the car. You know, we know we're anxious. We know we're angry. We know we're struggling with bitterness. We know we're far from God in this situation. God wants us to open the hood, look inside, and say, you know what, I've got a problem. Something's broken. When I'm willing to do that and confess to the Lord there's a shortcoming in my life, then God is able to come and instruct me. But if I'm fighting and kicking, as Scripture says, against the goads, it's like kicking against sharp sticks, all that's going to happen is my feet are going to get bloody. So God's inviting us at that point to surrender and to listen to what he'd have to teach us. We looked at this a few weeks ago, but it bears worth repeating. When trials come, and they will in the context of answered prayer, what will our heart's response be? If my response is complaining, grumbling, conflict, and division, that just tells me there's something that needs to be remedied. Look at verse 28. Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game, but Rebecca loved Jacob. You know, immediately, when you read something like that, your antenna should go up when you're reading scripture. This is obviously not the place God was leading them to. And we'll see in the next few weeks that Isaac so deeply struggled to see his second-born son, Jacob, as the promised child 
that would become a great area of conflict between him and Rebecca. Our only recourse when our hearts veer off course is to return back to where God would want us to be. This means there has to be a willingness to accept God's direction for our lives. Are we going to depend on him? Trust him? Yield to him? Or am I going to keep on fighting, struggling, laying my heart, be embittered? Scripture says Abraham learned faith. Isaac is learning faith right here. God didn't have to give them twins with a difficult pregnancy and difficult choices, but he did. God perhaps has allowed you to encounter a difficulty where you have a choice. A choice whether you're going to be angry and upset and raise your fist to God or you're going to surrender and say, Lord, here I am, begin to teach me. Help me to understand what it means to surrender to you and put you first. That's the better way, my friends. Isaiah 26, one of my favorite promises I like to, to claim is, He will keep in perfect peace he whose mind has stayed on him because he trusts in him. Trust in the Lord forever, for our God is the everlasting rock. Could you do that with me today? We're going to come to the Lord's Supper here. Uh, I decided to break this sermon to two. I was looking at it and I said, I don't really want to go. We're going to talk about Esau and Jacob next week and their problem. But we've stopped. So if you're saying, wait, I didn't fill in all the blanks. Some of you are filling our blanks kind of people. Just stop right there. Because we're going to spend a little extra time here at the table. You know, Jesus came to save us from the absolute mess that our lives are in. You didn't come to him whole. You come to him broken. You don't come to him righteous and together you come to him empty when we hold our hands up it means we're ready to receive Jesus came to save sinners which all of us are scripture says all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God the mess of this world finds a way to twist and turn our hearts and Jesus is right there promising us that in him we can have peace. In this world, he says, you will have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. And so when we go to the Lord's Supper, we're acknowledging that through his broken body and through his shed blood, that we can now have relationship with God. That's why he came, to atone for our sin, to die for our sin, to give himself up as a fragrant, fragrant offering and sacrifice that you and I may be reconciled to God. So I would pray this morning, and I, I don't know where you're at. I don't know every one of you. I know a lot of you and your testimonies, stories. There are three kinds of people in this room today. There's some of you who have a abiding, deep relation with the Lord and you're saying amen to all the things I'm saying. I, I praise God for you. That's a good place to be. And this is a time to celebrate what Christ has done for you. But maybe you're a believer. You've put your faith in Christ. But he's far away. He's just far away. I mean, you know you have a relationship with him. But somehow he's just almost beyond reach. That's the way you feel about that. That's not true. He's close to the brokenhearted. That's what scripture says. He's close to the brokenhearted. We just have to invite him in. What does scripture say? 
Jesus stands at the door, knock. If anyone would open that door, what, what does he do? He walks away? No. He comes in. And scripture says he'll sit and have supper with us. That's intimate. You have supper with somebody, you're talking about intimate relationships. So if you know Christ, you believed in him, you sense he's far away, this is an opportunity to renew your relationship with him, to, to reach out to God. And if you're here this morning, you don't know Christ as your Savior. You know, you hear this, you say, Pastor Joe, I like what you're saying, but I just don't know how to find my way. I'm going to tell you. Scripture says if you confess with your mouth and believe in the Lord, you'll be saved. For with the heart we believe and are justified, and with the mouth we confess and are saved. As Scripture says, whoever believes in him would not be put to shame. In other words, when we put our trust in Jesus, we no longer face a God and his wrath and his anger, but we become friends with him. If you haven't done that, I would challenge you that this morning is a day of your salvation to put your faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this table, this ever-present reminder that we celebrate as a church, that the center of this church is Christ. The cornerstone and foundation of this church is Jesus. There's no other name by which a man may be saved, but, but through the name of Jesus. And we thank you and praise you, Father God, for sending your only begotten Son, that so whoever believes in him would not perish, not perish, but have everlasting life. Thank you, Lord, for doing what we couldn't do for ourselves. And we pray as we take of this bread and drink of this cup, that you would fill us beyond measure, Lord, because of your goodness and grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for listening to the previous message. We pray that you were blessed by it. For more information, please visit us at www.ibcnj.org.